Robot Live panel. And I'm Mike Underwood, Sales and Marketing Manager for Angry Robot. Today we are joined by four fabulous Angry Robot authors, Adam Christopher, Ann Lyle, Carrie Patel, and Chuck Wendig. And our topic this month is series writing. So this is going to be writing books in series, reading books that are in series, how to, how to write a series, you know, the, the different types, and kind of digging into this popular form, especially in science fiction and fantasy. So I wanted to have our amazing panelists give a quick introduction of themselves and their, their work within Gurubot, especially series work. Um, and we'll start with Adam. Ah, hello. Um, my name's Adam Christopher. Um, I've had four books out from Angry Robot, which are in order, I think, Empire State, Seven Wonders, The Age Atomic, and Hangwire. And of those, um, Empire State and The Age Atomic are a kind of mini-series, um, The Age Atomic being the sequel to Empire State. I do write other series uh, for other publishers, so I'm, I'm starting to get a bit more experience um, in that field. All right, and we have Anne Lyle joining us uh, via audio, since there's a, some, a technical difficulty, but uh, very happy to have you, Anne. Hi. Um, yeah, I've, uh, I've got uh, three books out with Angry Robot, um, which is, in fact, a trilogy, a good old-fashioned fancy trilogy, uh, which is uh, The Alchemist of Souls, The Merchant of Dreams, and The Prince of Lies. And um, that's it for me, I think. All right, and Carrie Patel. Hi, my name is Carrie Patel, and my first book comes out with Angry Robot on July 29th. It's called The Buried Life, and it will also be part of a series. And last but definitely not least, Mr. Chuck Wendig. Hello, Internet people. Uh, I am Chuck Wendig. Uh, I write all kinds of things. Um, for Angry Robot in particular, I write two series. Uh, I write the Miriam Black series, which is about a girl who can see how you're going to die when she touches you. Um, the three books in that are Blackbirds, Mockingbird, and The Cormorant. And uh, after that, there was the Mookie Pearl series, which is sort of a smash-up of uh, the criminal underworld and the mythic monstrous underworld uh, beneath Manhattan. Um, that is... Uh, uh, what's the first book, Blue Places? I should remember these things. Uh, second book is The Hell's Blood Bride coming out at the end of the year, and the third book is a big question mark, but it's going to be a book I write because it's a three-book series, trilogy. All right, so that kind of leads me into one of the questions I wanted to start us with, which is why series? Why are series so popular for readers, and why do you think they're so popular uh, for writers in terms of uh, kind of a, the business side. Um, so I'll start with Anne. Um, well, I think there's, there's two reasons. Um, uh, w particularly with, uh, from, the, from the writer's point of view, with fantasy and science fiction, you put a lot of effort into building a world, um, and it, it's tempting to, um, to, to, to just write some more stories in that rather than throw it away and have to create a whole new world. And from the reader's point of view, um, there's obviously the attraction of the familiar, uh, whether that's the same characters or just the same setting. Um, you kind of, you if you like the first book, you kind of know what you're going to get with the second book. It's going to be sort of more of the same. Okay. Um. Any of the other three, please feel free to, to jump in, in terms of why series. Uh, well, there, I mean, there are market forces, obviously, with series. Um, sometimes when you sell a book, in particular in the science fiction or fantasy space, um, a book deal often comes with a, um, it's not just one book, uh, which on the one hand is nice, on the other hand is a little scary, because suddenly you have more than one thing to do. Uh, you don't know really how well you're going to do them. Um, and so what happens is when they give you a book deal, part of the question is, what are the next books going to be? Um, and it's a little, uh, sometimes it's expected or easier at the time of getting that deal to uh, predict and project uh, away from a single book as opposed to, um, you know, several individual books, standalones. Um, especially with the hope that if the first book is good enough and it's going to do well, then the books that will follow will be equally awesome and it will build on each other and create uh, momentum 
for people to buy, um, you know, in the case of the Mirror Black series, tends to be if they buy one, they're going to buy the others. If they buy the third book, then they'll go back and buy the other two, and hopefully there's a little more momentum um, when you when you build the series. And sometimes that takes time, but, I mean, in the case of, it, like, a Jim Butcher, um, you know, it took a few books, for, as I understand it, for him to sort of build up to the point where he, he really started to gain a uh, pretty big fan base. I think having a series also lets you tell a longer story. Um, it's not something you have to condense all into one book. You've, you know, you've got a bit more structure to build on. You can tell, um, you know, a story to get you used to the characters in the world. Stories where things get more complicated, and um, I think I think that's interesting for people too. And having it, you know, broken up into different books obviously breaks up the experience. So rather than ten thousand pages, you've got three books, or something. Yeah, I think um, there's actually two things there. What you were just saying about having a single story that you can tell over, you know, quite a, a considerable word count. Um, but there's almost like there's two types of series. There are those kind of series which are more traditional, sort of like a trilogy or, um, you know, fantasy especially is, is good at that kind of thing of telling a very long-form story. Um, you can have a series where the the story itself actually becomes the possibly the least important thing um, because what readers are coming for is the characters and the setting and if they engage with the characters and if they enjoy the setting and they f and it's something that kind of grabs the attention then the story itself doesn't really matter what they're after is um, is what those characters will do um, I think uh, Discworld is a lot like that right and actually, I kind of compare it to things like um, American Network TV, where you can have a series that will run for, you know, 150 episodes. <laughs> the story itself is is almost it doesn't matter. It's what are the characters going to do? You tune in each week because you're gonna, you want to see what they're going to do. Um, and that's how I kind of view that type of series as a book, as opposed to the other sort, which is a single story kind of told over long form. Well, that's the thing. Actually, it, it, the series kind of mentality, the continued story and the continued staying with, um, generally with characters, is really actually very popular outside of books. Um, obviously, you get it in TV, you get it in comics, you get it in more and more movies are uh, based on sequels and sequels and uh, larger series sort of uh, unrolling from the first. So it sort of stands to follow that books would... Uh, emulate that a little more. Though, of course, the, I mean, you have early series in science fiction and fantasy way back when, so, you know, I'm not really sure <laughs> which came first, which chicken or egg arrived on the scene. So that brings up a question for me. Where did each of your series within Gurubot start? Did you imagine an entire, an entire longer story, or did you start with a single story, uh, presumably involving a lead character, which has then evolved into a series. Um, and we'll start this one with Carrie. Well, being the wide-eyed novice, I guess I was just uh, thinking I'll, you know, make this whatever I can make it. Um, I wrote a book that I thought could serve as a standalone, but I think where it ends, there's defi it definitely ends with a question mark. Um, there's something that's going to happen to the characters at the end. There are going to be consequences. Um, for what happens at the end of the book. And so, you know, I thought, well, if, you know, whoever buys this would like to see more, there's definitely room for more. Um, you know, but again, if this is a one-book deal, I could, you know, do that too. So I'm, I'm definitely very glad this has turned into a series because I think there's um, a much longer story to tell with these characters and a lot more to explore with the situation they've gotten themselves into. And Chuck, for you, since you've got lots of series running. Do series tend to start in the same way for you, or have some come to you as a larger story where others come kind of more episodically? Um, they uh, have all been a little different. Every book is its own weird little book baby. Uh, the Miriam Black series was uh, a single book conceived, though with the promise and hope of more of her. Like, I had a larger story for her in mind, and I sort of knew where her end was, but that single book doesn't account for that. It's just, it's just, I mean, it functions as a standalone. Actually, each of the Miriam Black books, the first two particularly function kind of as standalones. You can just pick them up and read them, which is the goal. 
Um, Mookie Pearl started out as something that I envisioned a three-book thing. Like, I kind of knew what each book was going to look like. Um, and while that's changed a little bit, generally I'm, I'm sticking to it. Um, and my young adult series for Amazon, uh, Heartland, uh, is a big, like, it's one of those things where it's not just a trilogy. I sort of envisioned it as a series of unfolding trilogies. I don't know that anyone will ever read them all or if they will ever exist in the world, but that's, my brain is a, you know, that's the labyrinth I've crawled down. And Anne, for you, you've got a, you know, a clearly de delineated trilogy. Um, where did that start for you in terms of being a series or an individual work? Oh, well, it's, it, it kind of started out as an an individual book um, in the sense that I, I, I was just basically making it up as I went along kind of thing. It was, it was my first proper novel. And, uh, but in between editing it, I wrote a, I, I discovered that there was more to the story and I wrote a sequel. Um, and so by the time I came to Angry Robot, I had a fairly good idea that um, it was going to take three books to finish off uh, and, and tell everything that I needed to wanted to tell about the story. So, um, yeah, that, that's how it, it kind of evolved um, in, in the course of the writing. And then, Adam, you've also got a couple of different series. How has the process uh, for, uh, worked for you on those, especially since uh, Empire State and Age Atomic are maybe a little bit more standalone with regards to each other than some series? Yeah. Um, I'm actually I'm a, quite a fan of the standalone novel, whatever genre that's in. Um, I'm fans of you know people like Stephen King, who apart from things like The Dark Tower, um, has had I don't know 40 novels come out, actually all standalone more or less, with kind of cross-linked elements uh, sometimes. Um, so like Empire State, which was my first novel, and one of the kind of first ones I actually wrote. It was very much a standalone novel. That's the idea I had. Um, you know, that's the idea that Anger Robot liked. Um, I kind of, it's like what someone was saying before about you have built a world and characters and perhaps it's easier. No, not easier. Perhaps you want to create more in that world because if you put all the work in and it's kind of come alive in your mind, it's kind of logical. Um, so The Age Atomic, which is the sequel to Empire State, um, it's a sequel, it's got the same characters, it's got the same setting. I tried to make it a standalone novel as well, that you wouldn't have to read one, um, read one without reading the other, but that kind of didn't work. I think a lot of people have said that actually uh, The Age Atomic doesn't make any sense um, if you haven't read Empire State, so never mind. Um, <laughs> the, the, stuff, the other stuff I'm doing, I've got two series of Tor, two completely separate series. Again, one of which is, it's three books, but each one is kind of standalone. I've got the setting, but um, in each book it's different characters, and we've kind of seen different elements of the same world, because it's, again, it's like a kind of big world thing. Um, and then the other one, which I haven't started yet, but that's coming out kind of next year, um, that is actually a trilogy, my first trilogy, where it's going to be, it's kind of three individual stories, but an overarching story arc, and that's actually the first time where I've planned that from the beginning. Um, everything else has, has been kind of individual novels. Um, so that'll be interesting. Okay. So what I'd love to, uh, to, to get into from that, um, from what Adam said, is how do you and to what extent do you try to catch up the reader in a second or s subsequent book in a series? How do you recap or re-explain the world and the characters to try and capture a second in series reader, and do you at all to begin with? Let's start here with Anne. Um, well, I, I do two things. Um, I actually have uh, recaps on my website so that people can go and refresh their, their memory of the, the book. Actually, within the book, um, it, it, it's tricky because you, you don't want to bore the returning readers with with lots of explanation so I just try and trickle bits in to help orient new readers who might have come across them by accident um, and not realizing it's part of the series or you know couldn't get hold of the first one but it, it's 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 definitely a, a balancing act 
anyone free to jump in here? I don't, okay. uh, you know, it's tricky because with, um, like, the, the series that are more planned to be a series from the beginning, you know, some of it's a trilogy, uh, and you absolutely unequivocally need to read the first book, I don't really worry about recapping too much because... Yeah, I mean, it's, you just pretty much have to. Nothing's going to make sense if you haven't read the first book. With the Miriam Black series, um, I would like people to actually be able to read the second book or third book without being completely uh, bewilderingly lost. Um, and in that case, uh, well, the the lucky force that's on my side is that the, the premise is fairly simple to describe. Um, the, the, there's not a huge, giant meta plot. There's not some epic mythology. The concept of this character's psychic ability is... Um, not convoluted in any way, so it, I can. It's you know, it's easy to just sort of jump right in and give those beats um, and demonstrate them, as opposed to like, and by the way, like wink, wink. I'm just going to sit and tell you the, the story. I'm demonstrating them in terms of the plot, um, which is sometimes tricky but more fun anyway. Um, something like that. So it, again, it's a little bit different from something that's like a planned three book arc versus something that could be you know six, seven, ten, twenty books series wise. Chuck, do you, do you think that's maybe easier with um, a series that's set in our world where there's less explaining to do? Oh, yeah, because anything that's, as I said, anything has that, like, really complex mythology or uh, really intense world building, it's very hard um, to build off of that on a second or third book uh, without people having the foundation of the first book. Um, but again, then the question is, well, how much do you need, if, if it's that rich, if it's that densely moist of a cake, uh, do you really need to um, recap it at all at that point? Um, I mean, maybe some a few beats, um, things that are more uh, built off of the story than the world building or the mythology. But uh, yeah, it's always it's a tricky thing. You don't want to sit there and um, punish readers with a lot of uh, redundant material, but you also want to give them, especially if there's like a long lead time between books. Like George R. R. Martin should basically just rewrite the last book in the new book, so everyone can just read <laughs> that one. To get in there because it's like every book is like a 30 year gap I think is how <laughs> actually I find it interesting um, kind of what you're saying as a writer trying to keep track of things in a world that you've created um, if it's a secondary world um, you know it is much easier to write stuff that's set in our world and then you kind of you've got yourself a head start but um, trying to keep track of things. I mean, I have lists and lists of things, and, and if you're writing like the second book or the third book, and you think you want to do something cool and exciting, then you find that you can't do it because you've already established something in a previous book, and you're just like, oh, if I only could go back and change that. Um, it's, it's difficult, and I think it's something you have to bear in mind for the reader. Um, you know, how do you seed enough of that information into, into the, the, the subsequent book in a way that's interesting? Um, you know, it's it's definitely a challenge. I've found a challenge. I have lists. I have so many lists. <laughs> I have them like plastered, like you know, on my walls. I'll tell you one thing that was one thing that was phenomenal for me, and um, this really sort of surprised me, and it really made this because I'm writing the third book uh, in my Heartland Young Adult series. Um, I wrote the second book, and then uh, my publisher Skyscape sent me an email and sent me a document with, like, basically, like, a glossary and a world-building thing. Like, it's not even going into books. It's just, like, mm -hmm. all this stuff. And I'm, like, I was, like, through it. I'm, like, oh, my God, I forgot all of this stuff. Thank God they did that. <laughs> it's, like, yeah, it's, you know, no, yeah. work needlessly yeah. to do this for me. I have, I have the same, uh, yeah, my stuff at all. Like, I've got, like, a big 100-page um, compendium. Yeah. It's awesome. brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to grab, go back and, and grab a comment from Carrie. Oh, I, it's probably been uh, covered. Yeah, I was just saying that, um, like you guys were saying with uh, George R. R. Martin's novels, sometimes it can be happy to recap or helpful to recap a little bit, not just for return, not just for new readers, but for returning readers who may have taken a break between the books. Um, and I, I found that sometimes, you know, because if if it's a series where you're returning to the, not only the same world but the same characters, um, there are sometimes natural situations where you can bring those things up, you know, not go into the full explanation, but at least give some hint of, you know, oh, right, this was sort of the tone between these characters, or, oh, this is, you know, just a sense of what happened. Um, if you really want the, you know, if you need everything, you can go back and read the first one to be sure. Um, but I think as long as you avoid the, well, as you know, you know, what we did <laughs> last time we were together, uh, I think that can be helpful. 
would it be weird if the characters just said, read the last book? Just like, as you know, <laughs> the last book, wink, wink, and then you, like, you get like a link, a hyperlink, because everybody reads e-books now. I really hope that Deadpool does that. <laughs> it should, should. Yeah, the fourth wall means nothing to Deadpool. So um, to kind of carry forward on onto the, talking about a second, uh, second book and kind of going back later in the series, there is this notion in publishing and really in creative endeavors in general of the sophomore slump. Um, where do you think that idea comes from, and what do you do in your work to, to try to actively fight against that? Uh, we'll start here with Adam. It's a kind of interesting thing. Um, I think it's possibly not related to series at all. I think it's just probably the way that writing works. Um, you know, if you have a debut novel, uh, this is hard, hard publishing truth now. If you have a debut novel and you're a new writer, it's very exciting, so people kind of are into it and pay attention, and then your second book, um, you're not a new writer anymore, and you're not a debut, so suddenly you've already lost that kind of interest level, unless you've magically become a bestseller, which would be great. Um, and I think it's just one of those things where you just kind of keep, you keep trucking, um, and kind of not worry about it. Especially when you're writing, if you're writing a series, um, I didn't write The Age Atomic with any kind of audience in mind or trying to think, okay, people were reading, or people have read Empire State, therefore I need to do this and this um, in order to keep those readers. Um, yeah, it's a kind of, it's just a thing. There's a, there's a time factor as well, though, isn't there? I mean, with your first book, you know, you're unpublished, you can spend as much time as you like on it. You know, often people spend years on their first book. Um, and then you get a book contract, and suddenly you've got to write another book within a much shorter space of time, and that's a lot harder. And it, you know, a, a lot of people kind of hit a wall um, at that point, and you know, sometimes that makes them write a better book, and sometimes it doesn't. When publishing schedules are quicker now, they're I mean, oh yeah, they're not like self-publishing quick, where it's like I just threw up a book on Amazon in four days, but uh. I mean, it's it can be like six months later. You've got another book ready to yeah yeah. Mine were like or sometimes ready to go. I mean, there's actually you know the Jason Huff's series is like three books and I almost all at one time. I don't know how fast they were, but a month or a couple months between them. So other thoughts on kind of how to you know, how do you write that second book so much faster? Um, you know what what tricks did you learn along the way? Or what about the first book set you up to be able to deliver a second book faster? Methamphetamine? <laughs> don't do that, kids. I was joking. Please don't do that. Well, I think it helps that you've you know you've actually learned something writing the first book, and you ha hopefully have slightly more of a clue what you're doing. Whereas, I know for, certainly for me, the first book was very floundering around. Um, it, it helps if you at least rough draft a sequel whilst you're trying to sell the first one, which is what I had. I had. I mean, I ended up rewriting it from scratch, but I had an idea of uh, where I wanted to set it and some key characters, um, and, and that certainly helped. Uh, it took me, like, almost five years to write Blackbirds, and it took me 30 days to write Mockingbird. I think about 45 days to write The Corner. Um Part of the great thing about writing follow-up books is that first book you're always sort of, like you say, floundering about, like you're just flopping around, like trying to figure out what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> but in that second book, it's like you know the characters and you don't have to explain it anymore. You don't have to really build the world so, so completely. Um, mm. There's a lot of things that are in place, a lot of that fundamental sort of, you know, uh, I'm just sort of trudging through this and sort of building to something. You've already built to something. You've already possibly exploded something or people have already died. There's some really <laughs> good energy coming off that first book. Um, and so for me, getting the second book is, uh, so far to the number, the second book has been a lot easier for me. Um, just because I, I don't feel like I, we need to introduce the characters. Like, we already love them. I know why I dig the characters, and I've already heard from readers maybe what they like about the characters. So there's a lot, you know, the, the, the lubrication is already on the gears at that point. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. Um, Empire State, for me, took probably a year and a half to write. And then The Edge Atomic was, like, four months which now, which is like three or four years later, sounds like total luxury. Um, you know, four months to write a book, it's crazy. 
<laughs> you could do four in that time. Um, because that's another thing is that as you keep writing, you, you ideally get better and you get faster and you, just, you write. And when you have deadlines and people kind of depending on stuff coming in, then you learn how to do it faster. Um, that's just a kind of fact, I think. So what do you all Bombshell. do to, um, to kind of take what you've done in the first book and then build on it in a larger story for certain types of series or to continue uh, in other types of series? You know, do you do a once more with feeling? Do you change something up in terms of setting or character? Like, what do you, what do, you do to make a second work both a continuation and its own thing that's, that's worth building excitement toward rather than just kind of a slow decline towards nothing. <laughs> I think it's, I've found for me at least, I'm, one thing I'm excited about in book two is taking a con the conflict to a larger stage. Um, and I think that's something that always makes, you know, follow-up seem worthwhile. It's like, okay, well, we saw this thing. Why should we care what happens next? We should care what happens next because it's even bigger than what just happened. Um, and with characters, too, I think it's interesting to to force them to change um, and to find to put them in new situations that are going to reveal um, kind of parts of themselves that they weren't really previously aware of. Uh, so I think revealing those character surprises and showing how maybe events have made them stronger, maybe weaker, or um, just different can be a lot of fun too. Yeah, I think that kind of nails it for me because what I with the second books and always follow books, my goal is. So number one, make the world bigger um, to see more of whatever world we're playing in. I want to see more of it. Because um, usually that first book is a, sometimes a slightly myopic slice of it. Um, but as much as then in the, that second book is going out into the world, then it's also going into the character more. You're trying to learn more about what makes them tick, about their history, about what kind of, you know, what's the evolution of the character going to be. And, you know, and in both of those things, then what you end up doing is you introduce new problems and you, you escalate you, know, you basically turn the turn the screws and make the world and the character uh, more complex and convoluted. Yeah, I, same as Chuck. I think really um, the the first book in the series tends to be quite focused, but hopefully by the end of it, have opened up some can of worms that that really needs dealing with in the second book. Uh, so. Um, in the Alchemist of Souls, um, the the characters find out all this secret stuff going on, uh, and then I take them from London off to uh, to Venice um, to to deal with some more um, things, uh, and yeah, just keep on escalating the, uh, the the problems that they're facing. Yeah, that's definitely. The kind of the key to it, I think. You're you're, start, you're starting off small, and you're letting the story kind of grow, and the situation grow. And I love things like in comics and TV as well. You can see a pilot episode or a first issue. If you go ahead to the end, it can be a totally unrecognizable world. Same kind of characters, same characters, and you just think, how the heck did they get to to where they are? And I think the possibility to do that in a, in a series of books um, is pretty cool. The stuff that you concede early that can be so inconsequential and minor and then by the end of the series can become like the big, the big thing that was always there and always hidden. Um, that's kind of really cool. That's really exciting in terms of writing, I think. So this is going to be a question more for series that are one larger story. Um, how do you write an ending for a first and especially a second book where there are more frequently cliffhangers so that the ending of an individual book in a larger story is satisfying on its own? Like, What do you resolve versus what do you leave uh, kind of still hanging in order to, to kind of find that balance? I don't know. Have, have any of us written any sort of a whole story series? My, mine's the, there's a there's a, a there's a character arc that that joins the three together, but but each book is is kind of a self-contained plot, uh, and at the same time, it does each one does end on a slight cliffhanger. So um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I think television has a good model, um, you know, advancing a story uh, over a given season, you know, quote unquote, big bad in a, in a season or, um, some larger conflict, something that, that carries on to the season, but then the next season is about advancing that or evolving that or mm. um, a, a, a layer beyond, like you're peeling layers. Um, so it's not so much about taking one big story and just dicing it up three ways and being like, well, suck it. It just, it just ends. They just, <laughs> we just hit a wall at the end of book one, and then we had a wall at the end of book two, and book three will finally finish everything. Um, that, I think, is dangerous um, in terms of uh, upsetting readers. I think you can do that maybe a little later down the line with a series. Um, but, I mean, you still have to conclude something. There still has to be that narrative arc and that narrative shape. Something has to happen. Um, it can't just be this, you know, this fast train into uh, Nowheresville. I tend to think of it as um, each book leads to a new conflict, but a connected conflict. So, you know, in book one, the problem is this thing. And maybe you solve this specific problem, but just at the end, you know, you see the tip of the iceberg with a new problem that's related and that directly follows from the first. Um, so you don't necessarily have to feel at least, ex you know, exactly like you're leaving off on a cliffhanger, um, but you're leaving off in a place where you can sort of see what's ahead, but you've still resolved this thing that you've spent 300 or 400 pages working through. Yeah, that's a, it's a particular kind of, kind of cliffhanger. It's not just... Um, coming to a crashing halt in the middle of a big fight or something, um, because that just frustrates everybody, I think. It's a kind of cliffhanger where you've resolved something and then something else has come up, and ideally that, that new something has been some kind of arc across the story that you've already written, so it doesn't take anybody by surprise, although it's, it's still something that is... Not a surprise, but kind of something engaging for people, um, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I do that with epilogues in in my trilogy. The the the, the story finishes, you know, they they've solved their initial problem, and then there's just a little epilogue where we we go somewhere else, and you you see some of the um, the the consequences of of what's happened and, and a hint of where they might lead in the future, but with without giving too much away. So you know, if 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 you only ever read the first book, that would be fine. You just go, oh, well, uh, I, I don't don't care about this little hint. So you can read them um, separately. So to move sideways a little bit before we get into questions, because they're starting to pile up excitingly. Um, what are some of y'all's favorite series in books and in other media? especially series that you kind of think that you've borrowed from or learned from and how to kind of tell an ongoing story or an episodic story? Robin Hobb. Robin Hobb's uh, The Assassin series. Um, man, she first of all, she nails character. I mean, just to the very nuance of how characters work um, and how also to make those characters, to make really you, the audience, the reader, hurt through hurting her characters. I um, mean, she's needless about it. It's not. Uh, it doesn't feel um, uh, sadistic, um, but it's a hard universe and it's a hard story. And uh, you know, you, you kind of take it along for the ride. But the great thing that she does is, you've got this first trilogy, which is set when the um, nascent assassin is young. Then kind of this middle trilogy, which is middle of his life. And now I've just gotten the new first book, A Fool's Assassin in this third component, which, you know, there was never going to necessarily be one. She was just like, well, if I have the idea, I'll write it. If I don't, I won't. Um, and, it, and it fast forwards to the point where the character is kind of an older man at this point um, with children and a life and kind of settled down. And a lot of the characters you know are, are gone. They're, they're dead. So it's a strange, uh, you know, continuance. It's not something that's like, you know, well, it's just another nebulous year in the character's life and let's move the, you know, move the piece forward. It's this really awesome... Um, richly layered, uh, powerful series. So I totally recommend Robin Hobb is how you do series right. Sweet. Anyone other uh, favorite series, especially ones that you think you've learned lessons from for, and used in your own writing? I really like China Mayville's Bass Lag novels. 
if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I definitely love the atmosphere. I love the setting, and I think you know each each piece of the world that he reveals in each of those three novels is just so unique that you know it seems like he couldn't have really done it any more concisely than he did. You know, and the first book takes place in this city, New Propazon, um, and you know the next book deals with a different set of characters. Uh, and they're only sort of tangentially related to the characters from the first novel, but at the same time you see a bigger slice of this world that's just as wild and weird as the first one was. Um, you know, and by the end of it with Iron Council, um, you start to see this world as a whole, and even though it's, you know, different political entities, different, different sets of characters moving with different motives, um, you know, you, it starts to all, it, it all makes sense together. And, uh, you know, the way that it's kind of gradually revealed for you feels very natural, makes it very um, easy to digest, and it keeps it from overtaking the actual stories, which are uh, very enjoyable um, and which fit in, you know, really well with this world he sets up. I'm just looking around my shelves trying to think of uh, an answer. Any crime um, series that were particularly influential for you? Yeah, as an example of the kind of s series of standalone novels where you're following a character and a setting rather than a, a single story, um, one of my favorite authors is Lawrence Block, uh, who's a crime novelist, and um, he's got a series of novels starring this guy called Keller, who was a hitman in New York, and he collects stamps and kills people for money. and it's just one of those things where when there's a Keller book, you just pick it up and read it because you want to know what he's going to do next. Um, the story is a kind, there's a kind of loose story arcs, but it's 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 the character and the setting uh, more than anything. I think crime is quite good for that kind of thing. Um, in crime, you can have very very long series by the same author with the same characters, and kind of story arc almost goes out the window. Um, but yeah, science fiction fantasy is very difficult. Um, you know, I follow authors more than I follow series. I think, like Stephen King, my favorite <laughs> author is Stephen King. But like, he doesn't. Apart from Dark Tower, as I said before, you know, all the stuff is, is standalone. Yeah, I'm I'm struggling a, a, a direct comparison because uh, one of my favorite series authors is Terry Pratchett, who who writes standalone stories in the same universe um, and he's definitely been an influence in the sense that um, reading about Ankh Morpork inspired me to write about Elizabethan London which inspired probably Ankh Morpork in the first place <laughs> um, but um, in, in terms of, of trilogies I, I, I struggle to, to think of um, anything in particular that I can put my finger on and say, yeah, that's that's kind of the effect I was going for. Okay. Well, we can start bringing in some audience questions. And for folks who are watching, um, you can ask a question. The best way to do it is on Twitter with the hashtag AngryRobotLive. And we'll try to get through some of those. And some people who ask questions will win fabulous Angry Robot prizes, including works by are participating authors, so if you ask a question, you'll have a chance of winning one of those glorious prizes. So get to Twitter while still watching. You require multitasking. So we'll start with a question from um, Meineke, um, who I apologize if I've mispr mispronounced your name since I am so very Anglo-centric in my language. Uh, is it harder to say goodbye to characters you've written about across several books in the series versus a standalone? Anyone jump in here at your leisure? Uh, I just killed a, a major character in a book, um, and it was like a legit sad. Like I literally took an extra day to do it. Like I was like, I, I can't do it today. I just had to stop. So I said goodbye to a, a, a major character in a book, and I was like, eh. I didn't. I mean, I didn't quite. It wasn't like a tear-stained pillow night, kind of, but it was like a, it was a rough. It was a little. It was a little emotional. It was sad. But they can always come back. Yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah. But that's that, that's like such a thing anymore, right? Like they're back. Yeah, ah. yeah no. But that's maybe how I deal with it. Um, you know, <laughs> I quite like 
Well, I quite like Rad. He's the main character in Empire State and the Edge Atomic. And, okay, it's two books, and they're kind of done, and he kind of exists in this ethereal nothingness now. Maybe I'll do another book one day. So I, there's the kind of the potential that he could come back. Um, kind of makes it easier. I haven't killed a major character yet, so I'm not quite sure how I'm going to deal with that. I'll, I'll come to you for counselling. <laughs> I will. I will count you to just cry. Just cry it out. <laughs> we took poison out. And what was it like for you to to wrap up a trilogy and to kind of have your characters reach a certain point where um, you know maybe maybe you will or maybe you won't be able to come back to them and and give them those grace notes at the end of a story? Um. Well. For one thing, after three books, you're kind of slightly sick of the sight of them in some respects. <laughs> and, you know, you feel the need for a change. Um, I know, I'd, I'd always seen an end to, to, to Mal's story arc, um, the, the, the way I wanted to, to wrap it up. Um, uh, and so it was it was very satisfying to, to, to come to that end and go, right, I've, I've written his story... Uh, but at the same time, I've I've left some um, possibility of of going back to that world. Um, if if I ever have any more ideas for stories, which which I don't at the moment, but you know, one can one can never rule these things out. Okay, our next question comes from Nick, and he asks, when you start a project. Are you already thinking about a series, or does it turn into that a series over the course of writing? And we'll start here uh, with Carrie. I think for me, the buried life became um, something with like the the promise of a series as I was writing it. Um, you know, I think when I started out, I had I had kind of a basic you know structure, basic plot. I knew the characters. I knew the kind of trouble they needed to get into. Um, and I think by the time I got to the end, funny where I first I first ended at one place, and one of my beta readers said, "You need to give us something more." And so, you know, I flushed it out a bit more, and then it was like, okay, well, this is a good ending, but it's you know, like this is the end, but it's clear that something happens after this. And so, if I have the opportunity to continue it, I certainly will. And anyone else on that one? I think you're always writing maybe with an eye to something in the future. I'm not really sure. I wrote a book called Seven Wonders, which is a standalone superhero novel. And it kind of there could be more in that series. Because um, again, I've got the world, I've got the characters. I never intended there really to be any more, but you know, maybe. Um, in terms of trying to of things growing from a from an initial kind of start. Um, I wrote a short story, um, kind of novelette, which is going to be on tour.com next month. And as I was writing that, I kind of thought, oh, that would be cool for a novel. And then as I then talked about it with the editor, it's like, actually, there's going to be three novels, all of which just came out of comments and discussion about a short story. Um, certainly from the beginning, it was just going to be this short story. Um, so it's definitely possible. Um, I think we're all trying to, as writers, we all kind of try and see the future with what we do. It sounds kind of weird to say it like that, but yeah. I dissect pigeons for that. I don't know what you guys do. Okay. Yeah. Goat entrails. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Goat. That's good. Hey. <laughs> Tasty. Okay, and the next question is from uh, Rocky about uh, uh, I hate zero zero. Um, I hate critics. I think is his website. Um, so, what is more fun <laughs> to write the start of a new series or to continue write a new book in your previous series? And I would expand that to how are they different kinds of fun if they are? Uh, it, I like writing into the new the the, the um, existing series more. Um, at least at present, um, especially like I'm I'm hankering to get back to Mirren and Black. Like I, I have like an ache in my marrow for that. Uh, so I mean I, I enjoy that. I enjoy revisiting a world, and uh, it's like um, 
it's like hanging out with like friends, like old friends. Like it's not, you know, sometimes meeting new people is hard, but hanging out with people you like is awesome. That's to me what writing a, a follow-up book is like. Um, that being said, I also long to write some standalone books where I don't ever have to see those people again. Other thoughts on that one? Yeah, it's definitely easier to write a, um, with uh, characters who are familiar. Um, um, I kind of go through phases of being a discovery writer, and the, as, particularly with the first book, it, it's very much just a kind of brain dump on, onto the, uh, the the computer screen. Uh, and uh, whereas the, the second books, the, the subsequent books are, are much easier to plan because I have that framework behind me. I agree. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, go ahead if you like. I was going to say, well, this is what we were saying before. It's like you start the ground, you're on the ground running with the second book. Yep. Um, you can just get on with with the story and what your characters are doing, which is the whole point, kind of. So our next question is from the Roundtable podcast, which I, through secret knowledge, know is powered by Dave Robison. Um, do books set in the same world but completely different characters or stories still constitute a series? And I'd extend that into when is it more useful to talk about things as being a series and when is it more useful for them to be standalone or to kind of dis entirely distinct? I feel like people talk about the culture novels by Ian Banks as being a series. Um, and the China Mayville novels, I think, are generally referred to as the, the Bass Lag trilogy as well. Um, I, I mean, I think you can still think of them as a series, uh, you know, for no other reason than there's some kind of continuity between them, um, and especially in a speculative fiction world, there's, you know, just something extremely unique about probably the world you're visiting, even if the characters are different, even if their stories are different. Um, and so it's, I think that's, it's something that certainly unifies books, um, you know, even if, again, all they have in common is the setting in the world. Yeah, I mean, I have that with um, my space opera series from Tor and Titan. It's three books, but they're completely different characters in each book. All that is the same as the setting. It's a kind of this um, big intergalactic war. And in each book, I'm telling the story of a kind of different aspect of that war and the different people involved. Um, it's... In a way, it's they're definitely standalone, and that kind of makes it probably easier for people to pick up the other books. But again, they're kind of sequential, so there's going to be a, there's an arc across them, even though it's different. It's a kind of very much a larger arc of what's going on. Um, but yeah, it's kind of it's a series. Um, it's not a trilogy. It's not a trilogy, but it's a series. Maybe that's how it works. Okay. Our next question is from Peter, and he asks, how much harder is it to turn a standalone into a series rather than start an idea that you know will be a series? Or, And then I would modify that too, is it harder? I don't know. I don't know. I've never, I've never really done that. I don't know. I have not, not. That seems like it'd be hard, like to take something that's specifically a standalone series and then I mean, I guess it depends on the book, really. If, if it's something that's like, a, oh, it's a book about a detective who solves a case and the detective is alive at the end of the book, I would think you can probably just do more of those. Um, but if you've, like, definitively done some epic thing and you've ended it and it's nicely ended and then someone's like, do another one. It's like, ah, uh, it's going to be very hard. Yeah, that kind of I did that with Empire State and Edge Atomic. The whole point of Empire State is the mystery of the world. So when you get to the end of the book, that's solved. So to do a second book, it's like, well, what are you going to do? You gonna do? Um, you know, the whole premise is gone, evaporated. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was difficult. Um, and I didn't intend to write the second book when I wrote Empire State, um, but I did. That's right. <laughs> Sounds like you, just, like you woke up one day and there. Well, I just did. I woke up and I was hungover, and there was a book. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, but again, it's the kind of the whole thing of like trying to make it work so that people can read that, 
not necessarily having read the first book and uh, for everything to make sense. And, you know, whether I got it right or wrong, I don't know. Um, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was actually, yeah, it was fun, a lot of fun. Okay, um, so we'll do one more question, I think, then wrap up. And uh, let's see, I don't want to grab in here. Let's hop over to a different question on Twitter from Steve, who asks, um, do any of you all have a playlist that you write to, and if so, what songs? Especially if you have a series-wide playlist um, that then get, maybe gets modified per book. He said, asking a hopeful leading question. I, I have sort of general writing music rather than a specific playlist for a book. Um, I like uh, movie soundtracks and game soundtracks. Um, instrumental, I, I can't have words going on whilst I'm trying to write because they, they, the two parts of the brain interfere. Um, so things like um, the Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack and um, Thor, um, Assassin's Creed, just whatever takes my fancy. Uh, something with with and, and I and I actually create mood based playlists. So I'll I'll compile all the the sort of um, high tempo stuff together for writing action scenes, and and then I'll have another playlist of quieter music for the sort of sneaking around kind of scenes and so on. Anyone else write to music? Yeah, I, uh, as Anne said, I don't, I don't have kind of playlists. Um, I tend to get stuck with an album or a CD or something for a book, and it's kind of like this Pavlovian response where if I'm writing or editing, it has to be that, that album. And I have it on Rotate endlessly. You know, I wrote a novel to uh, one album by Brian Jonestown Massacre. I'm writing a crime novel at the moment, which is a combination of Black Eyed Peas and uh, School of Seven Bells. I don't even like Black Eyed Peas, but <laughs> kind of, I heard it and it came up and repeat, and now I can't, do, I can't work on this book without putting on that album, um, which is fine, because it's, it's all about kind of setting the right kind of mood for yourself. And if you can find, if, if I find something that suits the book, tone or atmosphere or something, then um, I'll stick with it. Um, I don't know what's going to happen when I hear that song out there somewhere, if I'm like shopping, and it'll come on and sit in the mall. You'll go um, into a trance if you get writing a book. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I can honestly... I can do, sorry. Oh, yeah, no, okay, did you do want to do it more? I was going to say, I, was gonna, I as a, you know, obviously the stuff that I listen to is words. I find that if you listen to it long enough, the words stop having any kind of meaning. <laughs> they so, become music. Yeah, yeah. Another instrument. Uh, I can't listen to music while writing. Um, it drives me completely nuts. I, I, I like quiet, and of course I have a toddler, so quiet is no longer an option. Um, but I can't listen to music. Uh, so, But I do, like with Miriam Black in particular, I have a series of songs and albums that kind of work for me. Um, but they don't. I can't do it while I'm writing. I do it Sort of like if I'm in the car or later on in the day or whatever. It's got. I mean, it's kind of inspirational for me. It gets into my head, but it's not something that happens when I'm composing words. I think I'm probably a lot like Anne on this one. Um, I have writing playlists that I like that generally aren't tied to a specific book, but they just sort of work for one mood or another. Um, I can listen to some music with words, but they have to be either kind of mumbly or vague or the sort of easily turned down with the music. Um, I like the Smiths. I like Doves. I love the soundtrack to Sword and Sorcery, the uh, iPad game. Um, yeah, a good mix of instrumental stuff and, you know, bands that can just sort of easily be turned down and provide, you know, almost white noise, but moody white noise. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, Hang Wire takes its title from a Pixies song, and... Oh. Um, the whole book is filled with imagery from Pixies lyrics and things, but I found I actually tried to listen to Pixies while I was writing it, and I couldn't do it. Um, it was almost like a kind of overload. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but it's very very important to me. Um, yeah. Okay, and I think we'll wrap up there. So 
I'd like to thank all of you for, for being a part of this uh, Angry Robot Live panel, and thank you so much to our audience and uh, folks on Twitter for asking questions. I'll follow up with some of you lucky question answerers, uh, askers, to, uh, to give you your prizes. The panelists will get their prizes uh, shortly after the, after the panel. Uh, they've been discussed individually. It's small participation trophies in the form of an email. Um, so, <laughs> uh, starting with Adam, if you can uh, you know, briefly remind us where to find you on the internet, and then uh, talk up your next book or work of arty type of thing that you want to, uh, to be able to promote. OK, uh, so briefly, you can find me on Twitter as Ghostfinder, which is a name I'm stuck with now. Um, my website is adamchristopher.ac, because that's my initials, which seemed cool at the time. Now I'm not so sure. I don't know. Um, my next book is not out till next year. I've got a series for Tor and Titan, which is, starts with The Burning Dark, and it's three books. I've got another series, which is going to start with Brisk Money, which is a novelette on Tor.com. I've got other stuff coming out next year. I've got a comic coming with someone uh, not too far away from this hangout. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you. All right, and Anne? Uh, you can find me on my website at annlyle.com, and I'm Anne Lyle, uh, one word, on Twitter. Um, I'm currently working on a secondary world fantasy series, but it's still very much first draft stage, so... Um, yeah, there's there's not much to say about that. So just just go just go and buy my Elizabethan books from Maggie Robot instead. Carrie. Okay. Hi, my name is Carrie Patel. It was lovely talking to everybody. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Carrie underscore Patel. Um, I have a website that is electronicinkblog.com, and my first novel called Buried Life will come out with Angry Robot on July 29th. And Mr. Chuck. Oh, hi. Uh, on the internet, you can usually find me in the ducts somewhere, usually eating rat bones um, and putting things in my hair. Uh, or you can find me at terribleminds.com or at Twitter, uh, Chuck Wendig. Um, my next book coming out will be Blightborn, book two of the Heartland series. Uh, and I uh, cannot confirm that I'm writing a comic uh, with Adam Christopher. I will not. That's not a. It's not even a thing. I don't, why would you even think that? Who who said that to you? No one. Shh. Shut up. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us. And there'll be a recap on our blog. And uh, stay tuned for news of yet another Angry Robot Live panel. We'll keep doing those since many of you are, have been watching, and this makes us all very happy. The robotic overlords shall stay their murder faces, but only for a little while. Thank you all so much. This has been Angry Robot Live, and stay angry. <laughs>